Good afternoon, my long lost souls. This is Debbie Q, and you're listening to The Right Shoe. Yes, The Right Shoe is a podcast about all things strange and unusual, especially when it references a death. I thought I was going to be able to get everything set up. I get my roadcaster, and do you know, I didn't realize you need a certain kind of microphone and I don't have that. What can I do? I am, I, it is what it is. And I have no time to waste them because we got many, many things to cover here. Okay. First of all, I tried a short last time and I determined that you guys actually like my incessant babbling. I like to get into the story, get really into it and let my speech go where it may. Sometimes it goes down several rabbit holes. I'm going to do what I've been doing, which is utter chaos, and it seems to work for me. I mentioned Carolyn Kingins in the last episode. I have a poem from her called The Northerners. I think it fits well. It's going to be a long one. Hang on to your hats, folks, because there's just so much. And the interview at the end with Caroline, it's two Northeast Philly girls and the way Northeast Philly girls talk is hilarious. Guys are always like, how do you guys understand each other? You always, you know, the way you guys talk. I, I said, because that's how we talk. We, we always want what we're saying out. So we all say it together. And it, it's just, it, you'll see. This podcast is about Byberry State Mental Hospital. The name changed many times. It went through a lot. It is what, as I said before, when I was younger and got into trouble, my dad, when I was young, young, he would say, you're going to go to Byberry. That was like the threat because it was so scary there. Also, I am going to be doing Fabulous Female November 1st. So it will probably be on the next podcast, which is Mayhem. Mayhem is next. Yes, it is. And I did an interview with Attila. He was the singer after Dead. First, I'll be doing the story of Mayhem, the tragic story from the 90s, which was, it's so crazy. It's a great story. Also, I am doing a giveaway. Now, this is serious. So listen up, folks. It's Grizzly Books a podcast. It's on Instagram. Her name is Gisela. She is an awesome person. Truly, truly remarkable. And her giving ways, amazing books. And I'm, I would not say that if I didn't mean it. Trust me. I, I wouldn't. I just wouldn't even get involved. Her books are amazing and her podcasts are amazing. They're well researched. She did Jeffrey Dahmer and Ted Bundy. They're outstanding. She is actually doing a giveaway for this podcast. It is the ebook for Jeffrey Dahmer. Go onto Instagram and DM Grizzly Books Podcast. I will put links all over the place on my Instagram and my website, therightshoepodcast.com. Instagram seems to be really working for me. If you want to get in touch with me, therightshoepodcast.com has a link to my email. Most people seem to be liking the DM at Instagram. It's shopaholicdev44. And you can DM me or DM Gisela to win the Jeffrey Dahmer ebook. And it is really good. If you are interested in Jeffrey Dahmer at all, I would suggest giving it a try. I live, even right now, I always live near Byberry. I, when I grew up, I probably lived within a three mile radius, but I hadn't known now where Carolyn Kingan grew up. She grew up on the original. I didn't know that the, the east side, the second side was what I had always associated Byberry with, which was the west. It's a south, the corner of Southampton and the boulevard. That is actually where the second buildings were made. I had never known this. Carolyn actually told me that the east side where like Mechanicsville Road, Be- Benjamin Rush State Park, there's like an airplane, the Northeast Flyers, I think they're called. They have their uh, plane flying things back there. That is where 
library started. And we'll go back in time. Bling, 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 bling. So you go back and now library there way back when we're talking in the 1600s there were settlers and they were brothers with the last name walton and they came from england byberry which is spelled b-i-b-u-r-y now they came to america and they settled and that's why it's called byberry but it was a bunch of farms here benjamin rush actually ultimately came forth too and he was called the father of psychiatry because he believed which is a little uh, but i mean at least he was trying to get mental you know before this people that were mentally ill were burned at the stake they were thought to have the devil inside them and i'll tell you what to be honest this has not changed all that much in it's to this day 2020 we still view the mentally ill as weak or unnecessary and i don't think we value that there's you know i think sometimes I, i've just noticed that a lot of people that are so i don't mean severely mentally ill but there's like this art artistic side to them this you know we only use 13 percent of our brain so you think about it they must use another section and and they they think differently so if we could tap into that you know, we might find out stuff, but instead, what do you, what if you, what, what scares you? What, what do you fear? What you don't understand? And we don't understand mental illness still to this day. And I, I don't see it changing, unfortunately, because, you know, it's just something people can, you know, ridicule and mock. And meanwhile, I, I, I it's come a long way. But it's still in that weird gray area. Benjamin Rush believed that, which was better than throwing sticks and setting them on fire and thinking the devil was inside of them. He believed that these people could be cured, which is kind of a fallacy. Or it is a fallacy. I don't think you can ever be cured, but you can be helped and you, there's, there's therapy, there's medications. He believed though that you should be put into like a, an asylum or a facility treated and then put back into the general population, which isn't that great. You know, you should be integrated kind of almost at the start because that teaches you how to be integrated. Although now there's many medications, I don't even know if they're used properly. You know, salesmen, they, they want to sell their product and they go out and say, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Meanwhile, there's a million side effects. So it's, it's a very slippery slope. Okay. So we got Benjamin Rush and time's going on. The years listed for Byberry all the time is 1907 to 1990. Now, initially they had wanted to erect this hospital, the new, I think from the beginning, they called it Byberry Farms. It was actually, it started out as Philadelphia State Hospital. It transferred to Byberry State Hospital, Byberry City Farms, Philadelphia Hospital for Mental Diseases. There was many names for it, but eventually Byberry just stuck. But going back to when it, 1907, now the Philadelphia State Hospital was going to be so-called revolutionary. Now, like they always had friends, which is up on Roosevelt Boulevard more. And that was all fine and good, but it wasn't free. And Friends Hospital to this day, it, it's still there. Also, there was a place, Thomas Kirkbride's Hospital for the Insane. That was in West Philadelphia. It is still there in some form. I, I don't know if it's called Thomas Kirkbride's. I, I, it might still be. It, it's definitely Kirkbride's. The name is still attached. And Friends is still there. They wanted to initially... There, the, Holmesburg, where I, I live in Winchester Park, but Holmesburg is right down the street. There was a prison, the Holmesburg Prison. It was dilapidated from the get-go. That was located on Torresdale Avenue. They actually filmed Up Close and Personal. It was a movie with Robert Redford and Michelle Pfeiffer. I actually lived on that street when they filmed it because we all had to sign papers that they were allowed to do this. And regardless, that's where they originally wanted to put Byberry, in a place called Glen Ford. 
it does it hosts a lot of weddings now they wanted to put library there they the residents were just furious absolutely not they said we we don't want a mental hospital here we already have the prison so they went across the boulevard where the where most of the farms still were now the farmers were getting ticked because northeast philly actually when i was in the 80s they were actually trying to break away from the city. They wanted to be called liberties or something because we were paying all the taxes for the city. It was making everyone nuts and, and we were supposed to break away and be like between Philly and Ben Salem. It was going to be liberties, but it never worked out. I don't think Philly could have lost us. It, it, it would have really sent them into a financial tailspin. But even back then, we're talking 1907, the farmers did not want anybody, you know, they just didn't want Byberry in their farms and they were pissed because they were paying for the taxes, you know, even the farmers. So they skedaddled, they just ran. They did not want anything to do with this coming. They gladly sold their farms for Byberry because Byberry was massive. Again, the initial buildings were built. It, it's called Benjamin Rush Park, and if I can put the pictures on the right shoe podcast.com, the boulevard runs down. It runs all the way up from the Bucks County all the way to the end, ninth in the boulevard, and then it goes to City Line Avenue. And, and that's a far run. Yeah, that's a good couple miles, maybe 10, 12, 15. I, I don't, I, I don't. No, exactly. It goes all the way to Maniunk and onward. So regardless, the beginning of the boulevard, it was on the Benjamin Rush side. There was the one part. And then they built the other buildings. I think it was 1940 to 53 is when they built the newer buildings, which they're still there to this day, but they're actually a rehab center. It was at one time. I don't know what is still there. They were building so much over there. Past there all the time, but it's been a long time since I actually took a look at what was over there. The last time I checked, it was some sort of rehabilitation center. And that that's at the Boulevard in Southampton. Well, so much has been created because of Byberry. 1907, they built the buildings, which was all fine and good, but it started out as a political mess to begin with. Now, it opened in 1907. By 1912, it was a disgrace already. There, there was cottage houses lit by gas lamps, which was a fire hazard. There was windows with just a few slabs of wood hammered in place to try to prevent escape. It, it, there was no toilet facilities. Several of the resident patients used metal buckets. The laundry was done by patients in creek water. There's a, several creeks back. This is where Chamonix Creek starts. So they must have, uh, we're, I guess, on the other, on the east side, because it wouldn't be on the west side. It's all, even back then, it was kind of all land. But on the east side, there, there was, there was creeks and stuff. And you can go all the way up to Neshaminy, Ben Salem, uh, Bucks County. It really leads into other, and outside Philly. The story house was full of holes because everything was just, it was a mess by, I'm telling you, the funding must have fell through right away. There was food loss and, and there, there was rats in the food. The milk was infested with flies and usually not safe for consumption. I mean, they had, at one point, the military was sent here because they were going to, after World War One. I, I guess this was 1918, they had a, a, a captain come over and inspect Byberry because he wanted to see if he, he was like, at first, very eagerly, okay, great, we're going to, we're going to get our men back on their feet, these soldiers that have going to war. Here we go. And he comes to Byberry. He gives it one glance around and he was like, I would never send anybody here. He turned around, walked right out. It was, it was a piece of crap. <laughs> I hate saying it, Marie, and I'm laughing about it because it's just, it's a shame. It could have been so much more. It could have been the forefront for medical, how to treat 
the medically insane. And it just became a disaster for so many reasons. Around 1938, the Philadelphia Hospital for Mental Diseases was officially changed to Philadelphia State Hospital. But no matter what you gave this name, it was just, it just never, what would happen is they would, they, they decided to give it state funding. And then it just became overcrowded and forgotten about. And this was never more noted than when a gentleman, he snuck in to Byberry under the guise of uh, being like an orderly or custodian. He, he worked with the Philadelphia Record and his name was Mac Parker. And in 1936, he disguised himself he went undercover and he took pictures inside and what people saw people compared to concentration camps they said it was absolutely deplorable there was like naked men walking around they they had put because they were so understaffed they put some of the patients in charge of children so i think around this time is when sexual abuse started what is that hell the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That's what was going on with Byberry. It became, I mean, when these pictures came out, it was just, uh, people were absolutely horrified. They started to build yet more buildings. You know, it just wasn't, it wasn't working. The only thing good that happened in the 50s is there, there was the, the revolutionary drug Thorazine came out. Now, I found this old tape. It's of a woman named Sally taking medications. And the difference in her demeanor is, it's unbelievable. I, I, it's on YouTube. It's called The Final Asylum, The Closing of Byberry State Hospital. I have to play this for you just to show you the difference. And I'll, I'll tell you what she's doing because she doesn't really talk at first. A revolution took place with the discovery of the psychotropic drug Thorazine. For the first time in history, patients could bring their symptoms under control. Tell me why you came back to the hospital this time. What was wrong? Now, she has her hands over her eyes. And she's making wild gestures. But she can't even speak, clearly. What did the voices say to you, Sally? Mm -mm. Sally, it's been three weeks now since you've come to the hospital, and during that time, you've gotten the medicine. Uh, how have you been feeling since you came here? Well, I was so sick, and I feel fine. You feel much better now. And uh, what are you going to do when you leave the hospital? Well, uh, I think now when I go home, maybe I don't have all the children with me for a while. I see. When not given properly, these drugs have side effects in some patients. Now, that's the problem right there, what that lady just said. Now, first of all, they show Sally in complete distress. Um, she's gesturing wildly with her hands. She cannot even speak clearly. The doctor gives her Thorazine. In three weeks, she, she looks great. She talks well. Everything's fine. Now, the problem was because, again, they, they just, with the overcrowding and the, la the lack of state funding they were, that they were always promising, they would send these people home. And you cannot just give a mentally ill patient a bunch of pills. And a lot of families really had, it's most unfortunate, but I think they could not handle the situation. Uh, sometimes I'm sure they could, but for the most part, they couldn't. So these people were on their own and they would send them home with pills. And as soon as you start taking them, oh, I feel better than you. So you stop taking them. It, it wasn't working. And then the 60s came and the big thing, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, he said that institutionalization was uh, not, it was going to be dismantled. Now, his own sister, Rosemary, this is so famous or infamous, actually. They had given her a lobotomy and she was till the end of her days, which was in the early 2000s. You know, she catonic, she probably the, the mental capacity of a child. And she was just a willful, spirited young lady. And in the case of men that were overly aggressive, then they were demons or whatever. They always labeled it something. 
because they didn't understand it. And again, it just brought forth these misconceptions and mistreatment, maltreatment, the ultimate disintegration of the person. You, you weren't giving these people help that they needed. You weren't taking the time. I, you know, now I, I under, I guess President Kennedy was trying to start these small community based mental health centers that were in good conscience, but it marked the beginning of the end for big institutions like Byberry. You know, psychiatry and advances in psychotherapeutic drugs were starting to become much better. The the state turned its funding into the more private and corporate mental health centers. So they started downsizing. In 1960, Byberry was at a 300% overcapacity of 7,000 people. That is crazy. I, I cannot even picture 7,000 people being in those houses. No. Oh, I thought, what must have gone on in there? Oh, and it gets ugly, let me tell you. There's a part in here that's not to be believed. Now, they released about 2,000 patients during this time in the 60s. And between 1962 and 1972, they started letting them out on the streets. They had to downsize rapidly, and they couldn't keep up with it. I knew somebody who lived on in the Somerton section of Philadelphia, which is where Bybury is located. And they said back during this time, even in the 80s, when they really let them out because they closed the hospital completely, they there was people sleeping on their lawns. You know, it was absolute chaos. Uh, and, and it was sad. It was very sad. These people, it breaks my heart. Now, there were good doctors. There were good meaning people that were legitimately wanted to help these patients. But if you don't, there's only so much you can do. You know, I remember I worked in a big inner city hospital and I was amazed at the amount of people who could not speak English and would come in with full blown cancer. And we would say, why did you wait so long? And they just, they were scared. They, they didn't know that a a state or a play a city hospital like ourselves come we will treat you and the city will pay us back and they will and they they did and and then they messed that up a little but at that time it was a shame because so many people especially uh, for whatever reason like the elderly that never learned to speak english it was a lot of people that could not speak the language that did not understand this sometimes they would be alone sometimes they would be with a family member and the family members would say to us like you know we just could not get them in here and they they thought they were scared to come in and i imagine that Byberry was the same way what did can you imagine seeing and hearing all these horror stories and then you're going to go to this place for help you know, it just was not possible. And the, the stories of them being shackled to beds and, you know, doing these horrible treatments that did, had, not, were not helpful at all were true. And, but that's, again, that's how mental illness is probably the slowest progress thing as far as getting to the forefront of it. This is when it really gets sad. And I, there's, there's several books if you wanted to read. There's one called Byberry. It's by the, uh, by the, it's the history press, but who wrote it is a gentleman by the name of John Webster. He, it's excellent. That really gives you the political history of it. So I had always known that Byberry had some wild, vicious history, but I hadn't realized just how bad. I didn't realize it had bordered on Ted Bundy-ish kind of bad until I was doing the research and I ran into actually one of the most comprehensive yet not overwhelming, um, because the, the book that I read was fantastic but and I mention it here and give the author and everything. The, the it was a little overwhelming with the political basis of it because the, the names start to wander. The point is, is that there's it's, it's called Philadelphia State Hospital, and it gives you a breakdown, uh, like a three part story of ha- what really happened and and the disintegration of Bybright. Now up to this point, things were bad. 
But they had been bringing in prisoners and putting them into a different section, except that everything became so overcrowded and overwhelming. And if if you were good, if you behaved, you kind of got some perks. So they would allow the good patients, so to speak, watch over the children. I think this is really where sexual abuse started to take place. And this is unbelievable. Things became bad because Robert Kennedy wanted the disintegration of institutions, which I I understand what he was going for. At the same time, they were just making these massive demands on Bybury. They wanted 75 nurses to be hired or they would have to get rid of, you know, between... I don't know, 300 patients, and, and ultimately they cut out about 2,000, which is crazy. They they were understaffed by 75 nurses, and they started, they let go 120 patients, just release, out and out release them onto the streets. This was in 1982. Transfers were occurring for the more serious and dangerous patients, and but some of them were like c- senile or just out and out, not bright. Some patients just didn't have the smarts to make it on the streets and they had been in Bybury so long. But then came the really sad things. Very heartbreaking. 1987, there was a patient that was found frozen to death on the grounds of Bybury. He had snuck outside during the night and he he just couldn't get back in. I guess... It was easy to get out, and then once he tried to get back in, he just couldn't. They found him on the grounds. Then, most horrific of all, a young female patient was raped, murdered, and it says disposed of. I'm not sure how what disposed of means because they actually took turns playing with her. I, I'm sure she was probably raped post-mortem, which is awful. And they said that for the next two months, her body was the entertainment for the other patients. There was one patient that ran around with her teeth. He was showing her teeth off. By this time the staff got a hold of her, it had been almost nine weeks since her death. I mean, can you, even the smell alone had to be just, and the sight, the smell. I mean, the nurses must have had PTSD. In 1989, two more patients were found while they were clearing out like the high grass and the weeds outside. One had been missing for almost six months. There was a problem with patients just being found dead. And then came the most heartbreaking and infamous story of all, which was Anna, Anna Jennings. And she had come to Byberry in the 60s. She had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. She had been sexually abused as a child. So she always had mental problems. And she was a brilliant artist her whole life. So she came to Byberry and it got worse because she was being sexually abused. Now, she told her mother, her mother investigated the situation, found out, yes, she was being sexually abused. She made complaints. Not much happened. Uh, You know, what can you do after the fact? And ultimately, she committed suicide in 1988. And she, this is where I got, Carolyn Kingian has, she's also my guest at the end, but she also read a poem called The Northerners. I kind of put that in here in lieu of, uh, you know, I don't have any artistry from Anna Jennings. I figured why not put the Northerners in there. So Anna Jennings, she, for her, Caroline is reading a poem called The Northerners. It's so haunting the way she reads it. And it's, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful poem and uh, it fits perfectly. And this was written in 2008. The Northerners. It seemed we moved into new houses every two years, getting up early those first mornings with loud yawns, an exaggerated stretch, almost contentment. Even our neighbors were shiny and new at first, and at first we were open, taking them up on their generous invitations of summer fun barbecues and southern fish fries. You in the center of hunters, 
fishermen, men who like to work with their hands, a man's man, the kind my father respected and took at their word. How uncomfortable you looked standing there, holding a cold Sam Adams, bobbing your head in agreement on the art of deer hunting, aware your dear wife loved animals. How I covered my eyes as we drove by their broken, awkwardly bent carcasses strewn on the side of roads. You watched me from across the deck, too, sitting at a picnic table with their chatty wives, dressed in black knit jersey, wearing my beloved amber-colored beads. You notice the nuance in our styles, the women in their pink and butter yellow polos, their white shroud capris, how their clothes reflected the afternoon sun instead of absorbing it. You couldn't understand why every sentence started and ended with honey, like honey, I'll get that, or you don't want to do that honey. It was a little too intimate for northerners. Such a beautiful poem, and it fit well because poor Anna never had a chance. There's a website devoted to her, the org. Ultimately, uh, Bob Casey at the time, the governor of Pennsylvania, decided that the hospital should be closed. Out. There was so much uh, sexual abuse and, and just people the the good people that were here it, you know what could you do it, it you can only do try so much they the type of patients here would need a real quick care not outpatient therapy and when when they finally did close Byberry completely all they gave a person was $25 a pack of bus tokens and an appointment at an outpatient clinic. Some ended up committing violent crimes. Some died from overdoses. Some from suicide. They felt they were had only, they'd been in Vibray for years and years. Some of them. So this is the only place they felt safe. It's just terrible that there actually was some place. You know that there was some people that were getting treated well here. It just didn't work. After they closed Byberry, what really happened is first the looters came and they just they took all the copper wiring, all anything worth any value was stripped in Byberry. And, and you know, that that was a huge thing. Then came the radio stations with the haunted houses. And ultimately in two thousand two, that's when I remember it. 2002, 2003, because my kids were a little, little. And we went and we went through, you know, the Q102 had that big thing. But there was also a lot of ghost things just starting. This is when the ghost channels with the EVP and all that came about. And I remember, it's still on the internet. There is, there's Facebook groups with many, many pictures. And also there's very... There's a there's a one Facebook page. I I got to get links to these. To, there's a lot of links for this particular episode. Even for Byberry itself, there's a lot of links because it, it, this one Facebook, they have some really frightening pictures. And I swear the one, you can see a ghost and I'm going to look for it because Carolyn showed it to me and it was very spooky. We didn't even get to the interview with Carolyn Kingins. It's fun to listen to, as I said, to Northeast Philly girls just talking. Caroline's book of poetry, uh, she does give a shout out. She'll tell you all the information in the interview segment. So this is Debbie Q. You're listening to Right Shoe. I shouldn't even do that yet because the interview's coming next. Stick around. Hi. Along with the, I have a special guest, Carolyn Kingins, and for this Byberry podcast, which is special for Halloween, along with the history, Carolyn Kingins grew up in Northeast Philadelphia. Although at the time we did not know each other, we have become close in recent months. And she particularly, when she first wrote to me, it was about the Tina Severance podcast, but she had said where she lived, which was Parkwood, right? Was it Parkwood was the area, correct? 
Correct. Yes. So, which is a little, it's a bit, well, I grew up in Morrell. So Morrell and Parkwood, we're only about two, three miles apart. But there was a different, I think on your end, especially Caroline, I think Byberry. Now, Byberry to me, I remember if we were bad or something, my dad would always say, I'm going to send you to Byberry. That was like the threat when I was younger. And, but I, and I didn't really even know what that meant. As I got older, I realized how just truly horrifying Byberry was, but you had lived closer to it and you have a really good spooky story and you had showed me pictures. There's Facebook groups devoted to this. It's of just how Byberry meant to you as a child, as a, as a child and a young adult. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad that, you know, we uh, connected um, these past couple months have been wonderful. You know, yes. Oh, you. absolutely. But, yeah, and to answer your question, yes, I grew up in Philly. Um, I, you know, when I was growing up, I have, I'm the youngest of seven kids. So, you know, all the, we grew up in a really, as you know, Philadelphia is such a unique neighborhood. Yes. Um, especially, especially in the 80s, because it was before social media and before we were distracted by that. You know, everyone went out and when you played and you, the kids played stickball in the front of the house. We played hide and seek. We played freedom. So I noticed like every weekend, like, a whole bunch of my brothers, my brothers and their friends would just disappear on their bikes. It was like ET when the kids were on their bikes. <laughs> yes. And I would just see them yeah. and I would just see them like disappear. I'm like, where, where are you going? going? Oh, Take me with you. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you what they would say to me, Debbie. Oh no. Every time I wanted to every time I wanted to join them on the Byberry trip or anything, like anything they were doing, how old are you? Yeah, they would say, I'm nine. Well you have to be ten. <laughs> Benjamin Rush, yes. Yeah, by Pequesting Creek. That's where they think the other, like all, like probably hundreds are buried and with no markers. And that's really, they, yeah. And they did inquiries into because they won't, they won't do like they have all these ideas to kind of redevelop Benjamin Rush Park, but the city won't budge. And some people have inquired, like, why? It could be because these bodies, they know the bodies are, you know. Very, I don't know. That I don't know. is, oh, yeah. I would believe it because it's so politically charged. I, I know the book that I got is it really goes into a lot of the politics behind what happened, and and it's just horrible what they did to those people. Remember, in it was what eighty eight, eighty nine, they just let them out. They just let yeah. them out, and they were just well, roaming the streets. It was <laughs> sad, and, and I read an interesting account. Um, not to digress, but her name was Anna Jen. Jennings and she was an artist, an excellent artist. She was sexually abused as a child in the 60s and like any child in that horrible situation, she was acting out. But back then, there was they said there were so many patients that were sexually abused and just had PTSD. They weren't they weren't organically mentally ill. So um, instead of her mother came on the record and said, instead of uh, we need to change the system in this in this country, and instead of asking what's wrong with you, we need to ask what happened to you. Yes. And her mother's name was Ann Jenkins Jennings and. Her mother, ironically, worked at a like some kind of board of mental health in southeastern Pennsylvania or southeastern Philadelphia, I believe. And and this this woman, this well, uh, Anna Jen Jennings, she actually was so brave. She was sending notes through to her mother by these kind, passionate employees that worked at the time at Byberry, and that's what started this blue ribbon committee that came in to Byberry and saw the conditions and really was like, this is unacceptable, and they shut it down. I mean, people were getting tortured. One person was in a 
four point or a three point harness. They were in that in bed or in a seat. I guess in bed for a year, Debbie. A three point or was it a four point harness for a year? Think of the bed sores. Think of um, not muscle apathy, like just your muscles degrading because you you're not using your muscles. So it was torture. Um, and she she was she tried to and finally there was one um compassionate um healthcare worker who actually ended up leaving the field altogether from the experience but he was the one that said you have ptsd and this is not you're not no and took her off all the medications for like schizophrenia i mean this is this is this is not like 19th century 18th century we're talking about this is the 20th century um, you know not too long ago it was our childhood our teenage years our glory days you know which was not that long ago that is unbelievable yeah 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 so it's it's fascinating yeah i mean like you said even i remember in the 80s even sexual abuse there was a, a show called something about amelia it was a movie and that had come out and that was like the first of its kind and that is in like 82 83 i mean i can't imagine that was like one of the first movies to deal with it on a broader scale you know the father was sexually abusing the daughter it starred ted dance and and it was like the first of its kind and and that was in the 80s we're still so behind when it comes to mental illness the fact that like you said some people that I that I know grew up with that were sexually abused they have PTSD and they're scared because most of the abusers of course say don't you ever tell anybody or I'm going to kill you know you your mother and and, yeah. and and frighteningly enough it's often within the family which is even worse you know what I mean like it's it, yeah. I'm just amazed at how slowly it's just taken so long for people to realize that you know you don't do lobotomies you know that was like the standard it's (laughs) i i just yeah it wasn't wasn't like president john f kennedy his sister yes yes rosemary or rose she got lobotomized and then of course the you know one flew over the cuckoo's nest we studied that in college oh that was a great book seeing ken kesey and then they made it into a movie with um jack um, nicholson Yes, and he got the bottom up. Yeah, so yeah. it's it's fascinating. Um, and I think Byberry, you know, during that time, it really had a lasting effect. If you were an observer, if you were in the neighborhood, um, if you were a patient, if you were, a, I mean, it just it's it's left its imprint. Um, oh. hauntingly, it it, le- it left an imprint on all of us. And and uh, yeah, yeah. And so what? Now there was one spooky part of it. What happened? I remember you said it, there was like a spooky house. Was it Mechanicsville? Or I'm not, I might be, might be getting the street wrong. Did you finally get to go with the boys? Did they let you? Or they... No, never with the boys. Really? But, um, uh, did yeah. you go yourself? Well, I went with some other people like in the neighborhood. Um, we, I, I actually wrote an essay published in the, in the Brooklyn base across the margin. And, um, yeah, so that's kind of the genesis of how, like, well, it was actually doing the essay on Tina, you know, cause I remember her case when we, when I was 12 and she was 13 when sadly that happened, but oh, that was kind of how I found you. I never forgot her. I never, and, and I could know, I would Google her name for years and never saw her picture. And it was like, it wasn't until, I was. I had finished the narrative essay. It was on memory, but I had weaved Tina's story um, because what I have an excellent memory, and how I have an excellent memory, it's kind of called an autobiographical memory. Um, I talked about memory and how we little anchor suddenly it becomes a where were you when and um my memory was i remember being at soccer practice and someone talking about tina what happened to tina i didn't hear it from the news or my parents i heard it from soccer practice because some people had known her and we were all talking about it and it just like i have never forgotten her yes ever, it, it ever. just was like one of those things where it changed the entire yeah it was like it changed her innocence yes because we used to walk 
walk. Like remember we, I talked about library. We would go out all day and our parents, we didn't have phones. We had that freedom. But after that happened, it just made a cloud. Like it suddenly changed us. It did. Yeah. It really did. It was, oh, it was so different. And I said that I, and I forgot you reminded me. I had said that in the Tina podcast about how, and it was uh, surprising to me. My dad, who was very laid back when my sister was out, you know, she came in and he, I had never seen him that angry. And my mom was like, you better, my mom literally got my sister upstairs because my dad was so furious. But in hindsight, I realized it was fear. At the time, I was like, why is he so mad at her? I, I just, I, you know, you don't, I would, as a child or even as a teen, it's hard to understand through a parent's eyes. Now I would think, oh my God, I, I can't even imagine what they were, the people, the parents must have been floored because nothing like that ever happened in our neighborhood. Nothing. No, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Exactly. It was truly a mystery. So, so when Byberry happened, I mean, when, see, for me, Byberry always was like this, even though it was so close to my house, it was only like three, four miles. I, but I was, it, it was uh, intangible to me, I guess I want to say. I, you know, it I just remember them, like my father was like, oh my God, they're, they closed by Barry and now the people are like, and I just pictured all these people roaming the streets, but that's kind of what happened. They, they just let them go. And I thought, where, where are they going to go? I mean, these people who have been locked up and then they had these Halloween, it was about 2002. They were starting these Halloween get togethers with Q102 at the time. And they had a haunted house and it was in Byberry. And I remember going in with my kids were very little at the time. I don't even know. I think my son remembers. My daughter doesn't. But we walked through and there was scratches on the wall. And I remember oh, thinking, like, what's that from? You know, because you realize that this was really by Barry. This was before they, now it's been redone and a lot of it has been resold. But it, at the time, it was still the older buildings. What was inside there? I wish back then, we, I don't even think I owned a cell phone in 2002. I don't remember. If I did, it was archaic. But it, it did, you know, I wish I could have taken pictures of what I was seeing because it, it was frightening. But I do see Facebook that I can link to because some of the pictures are truly just, it yeah. floors you. I was going to say the library that we went to, that, because there, okay, this basically what it was, was the new, I call it the new library. library. Okay. The new library was what, I, that's what I call it, but that was what was across from Roosevelt Boulevard into the Summerton area. And that was what closed in 19, December of 87. They closed it, but it officially, officially closed in like, 89 or 90 that's when they just shut it down and it became vacant and that's when all the looters came the first the this has come were the copper siphoners and, and oh like the, yeah you know, all of those that's when they officially but when we in 85 we went to i call the old library which was on mechanicsville it was all those buildings that were across the street from um across the street from Summerton or roosevelt boulevard and it was like that's the benjamin rush that's what I remember that, you talking yeah, about. That's where, like, so, so it, was, it can be confusing, but I never went to the, I would say, new. And that happened, that exploration happened from 1990 to 2006. That's when, not my time. So I went in 85 and 11, and it was right during the move crisis. Remember the move? Oh, yes. Was, I remember because that's how I remember as I make associations, and I'm forever linked to it now. And that was the day I went out for my my first urban exploration with the Goonies of Northeast Philly. <laughs> that is so cute. I love it. <laughs> first time and with our little bikes. Up, my <laughs> my or E.T. My like when they were on yes, their bikes. So yes. Yes. And, um, and I used to call my brother Elliot. It was so, so funny. He had a little jet, and, I, and my friend and I we were just connected, and it was so nice. And I was like, "Remember, we used to call him. I used to call him Elliot." And I felt so bad because he's such a good brother. But anyway, um, it's such a nice, you know, he's amazing. Right, but anyway, right. um, but but yeah, so we would get on our bikes, and I remember. Uh, back then, because how I came to see it was I played soccer. My my family was a big soccer family. My bro one brother played semi-pro in Jersey in the 90s. And um, so we we practiced 
be, behind San Am, Anselm's on Dunks Ferry Road, and there's a, a soccer field. That's where we practiced with Parkwood. And that faced one of the buildings. I cannot tell you how scary this building is. It was what? out on the hill, and it, and, and it looked like the, the hollowed windows looked like eyes that were staring no. at me. Yes, yes, yes. Staring at me from playing soccer, and I would just stare at it, and someone would pass me the ball, and I wouldn't even see it. I would be staring at the building. Uh, I, and at yeah. night, uh, it must look, oh, my God, that uh, must have been was, terrifying. So, so that's the building. That's the building I dream about still to this day that I went to and still smell. That's part of my essay. And then remember back in the 80s, the big movie was uh, Children of the Corn? Yes. Okay, right across, okay, right across. On Townsend Road, so you can go up, um, I forget the name of the side street, but you can pick it up. If you're on Dunks Ferry, you pick up Mechanicsville, you make a left, and that's where the youth park with Youth Association, where my dad worked. And you take that road, and it kind of goes, and Mechanicsville back then turned into Old Townsend Road, and it was a white road. I remember that movie, Children of the Corn. It was oh, it was road. so freaky. And the cornfields all surrounded the old library. I mean, you couldn't even write this. It's the truth, it actually, and I found a comment on Facebook, and someone said, I lived in the apartments right on Old Townsend Road, right, and it had cornfields, and, and, and it was exactly how I remembered it, that almost was a person, it almost had a personality, it almost had a, a, like, a human likeness. I, I still have the link, because I saved ever, all everything you sent me, I have, but I'm going to definitely link that, because that one picture, I swear I can see ghosts in that picture. Can you see it? I know. And that's the that's the that's the building. We didn't. I mean, there are hundreds. I mean, there there's tons back there, and they were all rotting. These are the old library. This is that was like library. the real library, yeah, probably. That yeah, was the real library, yeah. And they're all rotting. And I said in my essay that like people, buildings have their own smell of rot and decomposition. Smell, and that smell is like lodged in my brain. I yes, you're right. It, it, their own um mystery, their own like personality. Like when you walk into exactly. a building, you can uh, like just for a weird example. When I moved into this house, this front room that is my podcasting room, I love this room. I don't know why. The minute I walked in here, and this was when I first moved here ten years ago, the smell of this room. I, it was like springtime. I can't explain it. But to this day, it is my favorite room in the house. And I cannot, there's no, there's no concrete explanation for it. And that's like, I think when you walk into a haunted building or something that, ha you know, I do believe that spirits stay in a place. They maintain, you know, they don't want to leave for whatever reason. And I truly believe when you walk into like a haunted house, I, I do believe in the spirits, definitely, especially ones that weren't. We, I don't want to say happy when they, but weren't content, didn't fulfill what they wanted to do in life or were tortured during life. That, that horror remains, you know, you can feel it. In Germany, I went to Dachau. Unfortunately, you know, Dachau was the concentration camp. But when you walked in there, you felt that instant, the dread. And, and the there dread. was, yeah, the dread. Exactly. Oh, that's that's amazing! But I'm so glad you gave me those links. So well, that oh, whole thanks. area, that, yeah, that whole area just had this energy. Like I felt it when I was a little girl. Like because my dad was always at Parkwood Youth Association, and I remember my mom walking me across the street to the Potter's Field, and a lot of them are buried there. And I, and I just, it was like an imprint that that area had on me. Just even the roads. I'm not even talking about library. Just being around that area, just it, it somehow. I felt a kinetic energy. I felt different. It was just weird. I yes. Oh, man. I know what you mean. It's It does. It has a different energy. Carolyn, thank you so much for ever. Is there anything else that you wanted to discuss about Vibrary or any of your, your future works? Or I'm definitely going to link the Vibrary. What is the place called again? I, I actually have it. I'm following it, but it's. What's the Bible, the first link that you had given to me? It's a Brooklyn-based... Oh, yeah. It's called Across the Margins. Across the Margins. Yeah. Yes. yes. I, I go through that. It's very interesting. As is the Bushwhack podcast. I love that. I listened... Ever since you gave that to me, I do listen to that. For, the, I've listened to other ones of the Bushwhack, the, the interviews that that guy does. He does very good interviews. Oh, he's that, fantastic. Yeah, Alex, yeah. Oh, I, I, yours Alex, was... Alex, Alex. Yeah, that, that was excellent. 
Um, I think I think uh, we had a great time, and I, I so appreciate this opportunity. I just want to thank you. Oh Debbie, Debbie, yes, Debbie yes. Carol. Yeah, you're you're. Um, I gotta say to you know do a shout out for you. She, Debbie Q is is a storyteller. She is a fantastic storyteller. I'm at the edge of my seat listening to her podcast, like literally at the edge of my seat. Um, I, I love everyone. Um, she just has that it factor. It's just so cool to, to observe and see that. And I'm so happy for you from a fellow Philly girl. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, her books, as we said, can be bought at Barnes and Noble select bookstores in Brooklyn and New York City, Amazon. Amazon is where I got my copy before. It's called Before the Big Bang Makes a Sound. It's by Carolyn Kingins. Go get your copy. Also, her poem, The Northerners. I played that is kind of in uh, as an artistic nod to... Anna Jennings, who I, I, w- I think if she would have gotten the help she needed, she, she wouldn't have committed suicide. I, I think Byberry unfortunately made it worse. This is a really good episode for many reasons. It shows where we, we, we haven't come very far with mental illness and we, we should all be mindful. You know, when you see somebody in the streets, I we get a lot of it in Philadelphia here. People talking to themselves or an old man or an older woman that looks strange to you. Instead of laughing or thinking, oh my God, what's wrong with that person? You know, try to be... Try to be mindful of where they came from and that they could be a genius and just have a lot of problems. It it always bothered me when people made fun of people with mental illnesses. It always did because it's not fair. I, I wish that we would come a little farther in advance. And that is my soapbox in the next episode, Mayhem. And that's going to come out a lot quicker than this one did. Sorry about the delay. I, I just had a lot going on, and then I went down the shore. It was my mini vacay, and that really set it back a week because I usually get them out 10 to 14 days, and this was three weeks. If you go into Instagram, grizzly underscore books. Her name is Gisela, and she's written Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer books, and I read both. They're fantastic. To win an ebook, DM me, Shopaholic Zeb44, or preferably Grizzly underscore books on Instagram. And just put in that you want to be a part of the contest. That's it. That's all you got to do. So easy. And you could win. She puts it in her little teapot. She has a little teapot, which I think is so cool. She swirls the papers around, picks it out of the teapot, and voila, the winner is begotten. Next, I'm going to do Fabulous Female. I already want to give her a shout out because she's a fabulous female. Her name is Marissa Bones. She does all true crime and from South Africa. It is true crime bones. She is outstanding. Her research is phenomenal. Please check out Marissa on Instagram as well, True Crime Bones, or the podcast True Crime Bones. All these things. Okay, that was for my guest, and our conversation did not cut off that short. It just sounded like that because I like how she said Philly Girl at the end. So thank you again to Carolyn Kingins for that. I love that. And she really knew a lot. She knows Byberry, the layout, much, much better than I do. I, again, I lived there my whole life and I never knew a quarter of what she knows about how it started, how it laid out. It's amazing. It's an amazing story, and I will continually upload pictures and links to the right shoe podcast.com as well as Instagram because there is a lot attached to this particular episode. I want to get a couple things. Uh, there's the Goonies. It's a Goonies of Northeast Philadelphia. I want to link that up, and I, of course, I want to link. Carolyn King. I, I do have a link for Carolyn's book and I want to get the G- Grizzly Books link and I want to get the link for 
by Barry. The 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 really frightening looking pictures. So this is Debbie Q with the right motherfucking shoe. Yes, I said it. Ha ha. Have a good night, guys.